everyone for, for joining us today. So we're going to have a speaker, Fabian Pedrosa, who's at uh, Google. Um, he's a good collaborator with me. So I hope you guys enjoy learning about implicit differentiation and the newest ideas along those ways. So I'll give it over to Fabian. Cool. Thanks a lot, Courtney. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk about a project with quite a few collaborators from Google um, that has both kind of a theory method contribution, but also a big uh, software side to it. Uh, and I'm very excited about it. So as I said, it's work done with a bunch of people at Google and also external folks. Uh, so it's, the project was mostly started with people from Paris. So there's uh, Mathieu, Louis, Felipe, Quentin, um, Jean-Philippe Vert, Marco Bouturier, which are all in Paris. Uh, there's also Roy Frost and Stephen Hoyer from uh, San Francisco and uh, Jeffrey also from uh, Berkeley, from very close by. So uh, I'm sure that by now you've all heard a lot about the successes of deep learning. It seems that this miracle uh, will never end and it will touch all facets of machine learning. So we've seen huge successes, for example, in computer vision, where machine learning models are able to generate realistic looking images or increase the resolution of uh, very tiny images. Um, huge advances in NLP, where well, with recent models like GPT-3 or BERT, uh, we've seen language models that can interact with a human in a very natural way. Uh, of course, also successes in machine learning applied to science like uh, AlphaFold. And uh, if you've seen the news of the latest one that I've catched is um, uh, AlphaCode, which is a system that generates code based on uh, competitive programming competitions. So however, uh, let's see, uh, kind of dirty secret of deep learning is that most of the ideas uh, behind deep learning are actually not new, at least the neural networks part of deep learning. Uh, most of the ideas behind the networks that we use today uh, were already there in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, and for some architectures like multi-layer uh, dense networks, you can even trace things back, uh, back to the 1960s. So then if, if the ideas were all, why did we have to wait so much uh, to see all these advances? Well, my take on it is that deep learning is not just about neural networks. We kind of needed the confluence of three different techniques to see the results that we're seeing today. So one technique is, of course, neural networks, which, as I said, have been around for a very long time. And uh, what do I mean by neural network? I'm not going to go very deep into uh, the notation of neural networks in this talk. So for our purposes, you can think of it as just a very complicated uh, function that is composed of simpler blocks that are usually uh, tension multiplications and uh, nonlinear functions uh, applied component-wise. The other um, technique that, that is, was essential for deep learning is what I call accelerators. So the first accelerators were uh, graphics processing units. The accelerators, I mean, things that are able to do the operations on which neural networks are based, like tension multiplication and nonlinearities, are much faster than existing general purpose uh, uh, CPUs. So around the years 2000, people started realizing that graphics processing units, which until then were mostly used for gaming, were actually great for some scientific computing, such as the ones used by deep, learn deep uh, networks. Um, and lately, also, there's been other kinds of accelerators. accelerators for example, Google has its own uh, tensor processor unit, which is a bit different from the GPUs, but uh, the goal is the same, is to have special hardware to accelerate the kind of operations that deep learning does. Um, I must confess that I kind of didn't see this coming. In the 2010s, when I saw people starting GPUs, I thought, well, what's the big deal? Uh, it's just hardware that's gonna give you kind of a hundredfold improvement. Uh, as a mathematician, who cares about a hundredfold improvement? Like the big O complexity is kind of is the same. It's just a constant factor. Who cares about that? Uh, it's not like a quantum computer and that's going to give you an exponential uh, gain. 
And so for a very long time, I kind of dismissed accelerations. And a bit too late, I realized that there's a big difference between a computation that takes one day and a computation that takes three months. Uh, with one, you can, uh, you can iterate quickly and play with it. With the other one, uh, it's very hard to do research. So, and the, the last technique that I think was essential for the success of deep learning is automatic differentiation. So because this neural network, they're kind of composed of uh, many different parts that are composed with each other. And also because they tend to run on these accelerators, it's very painful to compute their gradients. You can totally do it by hand, but it's very error prone. And again, it's something, um, if you do it by hand, it's not something on which you can iterate quickly. So automatic differentiation is a tool that computes the gradients for you uh, and has been essential in, 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 I think, the popularization of deep learning. And it's also going to be the topic of, of my talk. So I don't know if you've used automatic differentiation before. How it works is actually pretty simple. Um, suppose that you want to compute the derivative of this function f. So what an automatic differentiation engine is going to do is that it's going to evaluate this expression, uh, but at the same time, keep track of all the operations that it does. So how a computer would start evaluating this is by first looking in the most uh, nested part of the expression. So it's going to compute this kind of uh, vector product. It's going to keep track of that. Then he's going to compute the exponential of it. Uh, he's going to keep track of it. Then he's going to add one. And finally, he's going to invert the whole thing. So the automatic differentiation engine that keeps track of keeps track of everything, what it's going to do is that for each one of these operations that it, uh, it has done, it has a small database in which he knows what are the derivative of every one of these elementary operations, like the product, exponential, and so on. And it's going to apply these operations again in reverse order. And uh, because of the chain rule, uh, applying of the, all these operations, but now on using the derivative instead of the original function, you're going to get back uh, the derivative of your function uh, or, or the expression that you, that you used. Uh, so a couple of precisions on what automatic differentiation is. First is that it's not the same as symbolic differentiation. So what I mean by symbolic differentiation is something, um, software like Mathematica, that you can give him a, an expression f and he will write down what the derivative is. Automatic differentiation is a bit more subtle it has subtle differences. Uh, so it will never write down the expression. It will just apply whatever, whatever you uh, was in the, in the original function. Uh, one advantage of that, for example, is that it can deal very easily with control flow. Like if you have if statements, for loops, anything like that, automatic differentiation will just uh, keep track of what it does and apply in reverse and work seamlessly. While symbolic differentiation is gonna have a lot of issues with these things. Automatic differentiation is also a bit different from numerical differentiation, which by this I understand um, doing finite differences, so approximating the derivative numerically. Automatic differentiation gives you the exact derivative, is no approximation. Okay, um, so in practice, how, how is this used? Well, one of the magics of automatic differentiation is that it kind of works out of the box. So nowadays, there's many packages like JAX, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, whatnot, that include automatic differentiation. And how it works is that you can write your objective function or the, the function that you want to compute the derivative. Here, for example, I called it loss. And this, this function can depend, for example, on other functions. Here, this loss depends on a function predict, that was defined before, that has a for loop in it. Um, and automatic differentiation doesn't care. Uh, you usually have a, a function called gradient or something like that, that when you call gradient of whatever function is gonna compute the, the derivative of that function using automatic differentiation. So from the user kind of perspective, it's kind of seamless. Uh, on any function that uses elementary operations, you're gonna apply automatic differentiation and it kind of works outside of the box. Now, um, where automatic differentiation kind of breaks down is when you don't have a function in, that can be expressed in terms of this elementary operations. Um, 
So as you, as you surely know, most interesting functions in physics or mathematics are not given by this kind of closed form sequence of operations. Uh, physical forms are not typically given as a direct expression. They're usually given as a solution of some dynamical system or some differential equation or some partial differential equations. So how do we compute derivatives of, of these kinds of functions? In machine learning, there's also other applications for uh, implicit functions. So one of one kind of very exciting recent use case is what we will call implicit layers, in which a layer of a neural network is no longer just tensor multiplication uh, composed with a nonlinearity, is something more complicated like the solution to a optimization problem. One of the papers that I really like is this SATNET paper of 2009, in which uh, early layers of a neural network were standard uh, convolutional neural network layers, like the ones you usually use uh, to predict digits um, from, from an image. Uh, but higher layers were actually a, a Boolean satisfiability solver. So kind of some, some uh, theorem prover that they after relax to be an SDP. So higher layers are a semi-definite program. Um, so this is kind of a layer that it's itself an optimization problem and that can solve two docus, for example. So what they had at the end was a neural network that uh, could at the same time recognize the digits on this Sudoku with handwritten images and solve the Sudoku at the same time. And you can train everything everything together, no need to have like specialized modules. Uh, another kind of recent work that uh, I've been involved with a student is to, uh, to have as a layer of a neural network, uh, lasso solver, so uh, kind of a feature selection step that would select some features in the image and then do the prediction only based on those features. So contrary to doing that feature selection on the whole data set, this allows you to special case and have select different features for different, uh, different samples, which can be very useful. Um, for example, when, uh, when different features are, are useful for different samples. Another area where it's useful to differentiate implicit function is in uh, bi-level problems. So there's many problems in machine learning that can be posed as bi-level problems. Uh, GANs is one of them. A couple of others that I'm interested in is dataset distillation, where your goal is to learn uh, both uh, a machine learning model, like a neural network, but also the data set on which you're turning that neural network. And that allows you, for example, to massively reduce the size of your data set. So here on the top, I have a data set that has just nine images and training uh, just one layer, a neural network on this gives uh, accuracy of 90% on MNIST. So that's very useful because then you can ship a machine learning model uh, with very few images instead of the whole data set, for example. Uh, another area where bi-level optimization is kind of useful is in neural architecture search, where you want to learn uh, not only the weights of your neural network, but also what is the architecture. Is it convolutions that, uh, in the neural network? Is it connected layers? How many layers? These kind of questions. So I think that was it for the motivation. I don't know. Now would be a good moment if anyone has questions. Otherwise, I will go on. Don't hesitate to interrupt me at any moment if, if things are not clear. Hi. Uh, yeah. I had a question. Hey. So uh, sure. about the kind of comparison between um, numerical differentiation and automatic differentiation. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was wondering if you, you were mentioning, in principle, there's no loss of accuracy because you have the exact formulas. But I was yeah. wondering if this nested evaluation mm -hmm. can actually create problems in a floating yeah. point environment. So is that an issue or is like not a concern? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I will come back to that. Okay. Uh, you do lose accuracy if your expression is very, very, very long indeed because of numerical, numerical accuracy, absolutely. Okay, so the, for the rest of the talk, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present a few approaches that exist to differentiate these implicit functions. 
Uh, then I'm going to present what is the approach that we implemented and then discuss a bit more about the, the software and uh, some open problems, uh, fortunately or unfortunately for many still. So let's go for how can you differentiate implicit functions. So there's mainly two big, two, two most common approaches to do it. One is called unrolling and the other one is called implicit differentiation. Um, unrolling is kind of um, very intuitively you're replacing your original function by something uh, that is close to it. Technically it's kind of a truncated series approximation. Uh, while implicit differentiation, you're replacing the implicit function that you care about by something uh, that kind of behaves like what you care about, but is not exactly what you care about. So to be a bit more precise, uh, I need to introduce some notation. Uh, so I'm going to call the Im implicit functions. Uh, the rest of the time, I'm going to use a lot of implicit functions. I'm going to call that x star. OK? Um, and I'm going to assume it takes an argument theta that lives in Rn. And the output can be in, uh, in a d-dimensional space. Um, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that this implicit, this, this implicit function x star is given as the solution of some optimization, optimization problem with uh, loss function f. Uh, most of what I'm going to say applies also if instead of an optimization problem is given by a fixed point of some equation or the solution to an ODE, but to simplify, I'm mostly going to assume that we're dealing with solutions to optimization problems. And so my goal is to compute the Jacobian of this x star uh, function. Okay. So the first approach is enroll differentiation. Um, for this to kind of make sense, you first need to assume that you already have an algorithm that converges to the solution of your implicit, uh, implicit function. So let's assume that this algorithm is gradient descent. So we have a sequence of iterate x1, x2, x3, et cetera, that converge to the solution to the x star function. And the main idea is very simple, is that you're going to approximate x star by doing a finite number of steps of gradient descent. And then the, the magic is that here in, in xt, so uh, when t is a finite number of iterations, all that you've done to arrive there is just take steps of gradient descent. And assuming the gradient is something you can compute, these are very elementary operations. You're just adding some numbers together, right? Or, or so, some vectors. So automatic differentiation is super happy to differentiate through that. Uh, can I ask you a quick question, Fabio? Sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, one example for a solution function of, of a simple optimization problem mm -hmm. with the proximal, I mean, proximal operator, right? Yeah. You can't differentiate that thing at every point. So that's, that's already, I mean, what, what kind of assumptions go into, go into this uh, mm -hmm. yeah. whole procedure? Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to that, I think, in the next slide. OK. You mean like to, to be well posed? Yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only doesn't, does the solution map not have mm -hmm. to be differentiable, it could also be a set. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't put much detail into this slides. The paper has much more detail on what are the sufficient and necessary conditions. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to come back a bit to the regularity conditions okay. that you need. Thanks. Yeah. OK, um, so back to unroll un differentiation. The main benefit of it is that it's very simple to implement. If you have an algorithm that converges to the solution, uh, you just pass that to some di automatic differentiation engine and you'll get back the solution. Uh, some of the drawbacks is that you need to re-implement the algorithm on something that supports automatic differentiation. Uh, you cannot just use you know, existing solvers that might be coded in Fortran to, uh, uh, to do this. 
Uh, another drawback is that the, the complexity scales with the number of inputs. Uh, also, this uh, it's more of a subtle point because there's two kinds of automatic differentiation. There's forward mode and reverse mode, and they have different complexities. Uh, but in general, it scales much worse than the approach that I'm going to say uh, present just after. And this is especially problematic on GPU because GPUs have much less memory than uh, than CPUs. And uh, as, uh, as someone mentioned before, uh, you also sometimes have an issue as loss of precision over long time horizons. Uh, typically, people that use unreal differentiation just use I don't know, 100 steps of gradient descent, uh, 1,000 maybe. But if you start doing uh, more than that, you're typically going to get either very, very low precision or uh, gradient exploding or vanishing. Uh, and in general, it's just a bit less accurate than implicit differentiation that I'm going to present right now. So the main idea of implicit differentiation is uh, to say, OK, we, cannot we don't know how to differentiate through an argument, but we kind of know how to differentiate an implicit equation. So kind of assuming that your solution set is unique, uh, most works here assume that your function f is strongly convex. Uh, then you can characterize the optimal points of your function S star by, as the points that on which the gradient is zero. And so if you do that, then uh, you can completely characterize your function X star through this implicit equation. I'm going to call the gradient of F uh, big F. So then I have an equation, it's called big F of X equals zero, and that characterizes my implicit equation. Now, if you differentiate, again, this implicit equation, uh, what happens is that uh, you end up with something that looks like this. And where luckily you have the Jacobian that you care outside that's multiplying uh, the derivative of this big F function, which uh, tracking it down to my original loss is the second derivative of my objective function F. Um, so for this to make sense, I need uh, my objective function to be twice differentiable. And there's also the derivative in the other direction. So I need f to be twice, sorry, my objective function f to be twice differentiable in both its first and its second argument. Um, okay. And then if you do that, uh, the, the implicit function theorem gives you guarantees that, uh, that well, this equation uh, that they, sorry, that uh, the inverse of this exists and that your Jacobian is well, um, well defined. So in practice, how this works is that you form these equations and by solving a linear system, because this is a linear system, you can find the, the Jacobian that, that you're seeking. Now, a couple of issues with this approach is that the derivation of this, so it started from gradient descent, for example, but if you have a different solver, uh, the implicit equation is a bit different. And so, so far, this, this approach needed to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, computing this uh, matrices that, by the way, I'm going to call uh, A and B. Um, and so, if you change something in the model, you need to re-derive expressions for, uh, for these matrices. So basically, our main contribution is to address this problem, to have something that's a bit more, um, uh, a bit more flexible, and that doesn't doesn't need you to re-derive all these equations every time you write. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. So. Um, how we're going to solve this. So our approach is to ask the user to provide a, uh, what we need, which in this case is just the objective function f, so small f, uh, or loss function in the original problem. And then we're going to use automatic differentiation to compute all the quantities that we need. So if you remember from the implicit function theorem, we need its gradient that I call uh, big F, and we also need the gradient of the gradient that uh, I think I called the matrix A. One nice thing about automatic differentiation 
is that it works seamlessly not just to compute the derivative, but also to compute higher order derivatives, second and third and cross derivatives and whatnot. And then, of course, we still need to solve the system. Uh, and for that, you can use iterative solvers. So I think this is going to be a bit more clear uh, with an example. So suppose that I have uh, an objective function uh, as, uh, as this, a rich regression problem where I'm solving a least squares problem. Uh, and I have some regularization uh, in which I'm calling theta the amount of regularization that I have. Uh, in the left, I'm plotting this solution. So each one of the colors would be, for example, the would be the one of the coefficients in my solution. Uh, so what this means is when you have low regularization, solutions are big, the more you regularize because you're kind of penalizing the norm of the solutions, the more your solution kind of goes to zero. Uh, so one thing you might want to do is compute the derivative with respect to the regularization parameter, for example, to know how stable your solution is, or maybe because this is part of some hyperparameter optimization problem, in which case you need also to compute uh, that derivative. So how would we do this in, uh, in our framework? So it's very easy. Uh, you would define what is your objective function that I called f in the previous slide. Uh, so as I said, this is a least worst loss plus some regularization parameter. And then you would define also the mapping uh, x star. So this x star is just computing the solution using whatever solver, in this case, gradient descent, okay? And then running gradient descent for a fixed number of iterations and returning the solution. So this kind of function, the arguing function would be what I call the x star, okay? So now what I can do uh, in this framework is that I can call a function called Jack's Jacobian, which is the standard thing in, in Jack's to compute the Jacobian of a function. Uh, so I can call it on this function that I defined. And what's going to happen under the hood, under the hood is that this solver grid in the scent, which is kind of the one that we implemented, all the rest is things that are already existed. Uh, when he detects that you know, Jacobian has been called on it, it's going to generate the using automatic differentiation is going to generate the functions capital F and its derivative and form the system uh, that characterizes the Jacobian and solve it. So one of the cool things about this is that everything is kind of uh, handled by the automatic differentiation solver. The user never needs to compute this uh, gradient of F or the cross derivatives or anything. All that is generated from the original objective function. So of course, the benefit of this is that uh, you have an optimization solver that is aware of the simplicity differentiation rules and doesn't need, you don't need to pass it anything except the original uh, objective function, which you anyway needed to pass. Um, as you saw, I'm not using like any custom gradient function is the, the standard in JAX way to compute uh, gradients, in this case, Jacobians that we're using. Um, and another thing that I'm going to talk a bit now is that it could be extended to other solvers. I started using gradient descent, but the same approach kind of translates to other solvers. So for example, uh, projected gradient descent. Um, in this case, uh, of course, your original objective is no longer differentiable. Well, okay, it can be, but typically if you're using projected green descent it's because you have some non-differentiability in your original problem. Uh, however, instead of the gradient, in this case, you can use a different implicit function, which would be kind of doing one step of uh, projected green descent. And this is, um, uh, so this also characterize your, um, implicit function, your solution uh, x star. Uh, we know that the projection is Lipschitz, so you can differentiate everything. At least it's almost everywhere differentiable. And uh, all, again, almost everywhere, this system does make sense and you can invert it to compute uh, uh, the Jacobian that you're looking for. So, 
So one of the nice things about the about the, the library that 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 we developed is that it works across using this technique of instead of for every solver looking at what's the optimized sorry, sorry looking at what's the um, fixed point equation it kind of extends naturally to many many other solvers. Uh, so for uncontrained optimization it's kind of natural to use the gradient for this uh, fixed point equation. For proximal gradient descent, you would use the gradient and the prox. Uh, for mirror descent, you would also use the, the mirror map. Uh, for use of matter, it would be a slightly different optimality condition. Uh, it also extends to chronic programming, uh, QPs, LPs, etc. So maybe uh, it'd be a good time to stop if someone has questions. I don't know if I'm going too fast or whether this is clear. So I'm gonna go on. Um, so in this procedure, as you as, as you might have noticed, there's some sources of error. So there's two different sources of error in this in uh, computing the Jacobian. One is that uh, those so the formula of the implicit functional theorem assumes that you already know a solution of your problem. In practice, you never know exactly the solution. You can just approximate it. So that's one source of error. How far are you from the solution? The implicit equation. Uh, like solving the linear system only makes sense when you're at the solution. Uh, far away, uh, it might not give you the right Jacobian. Uh, and the second source of error is that uh, solving the linear system is also done usually uh, approximately. So for the first kind of source of, er of error, we do have some, uh, some bounds and some guarantees. Uh, so, what this theorem basically says is that first you need to assume that um, your the, the derivatives of a and b are bounded have a bounded uh, largest eigenvalue. So remember, big F is the Hessian of your original objective. So what you're saying is that there's a bound on the Hessian of your objective. Uh, unfortunately, for this inversion of the linear system to uh, like to recover to make some claims on the solution of the linear system we also need to assume this which says that your smallest eigenvalue is bounded away from zero so basically we're saying that your objective function is strongly convex this is something i would like to remove in the future uh, but so far we've, need, we've not been able to and if you do that then you do have a bound on the difference between like on the Jacobian that is returned by the software versus the real Jacobian. Um, and it's this expression, the, the part that I find most frustrating here is this alpha squared. So basically it's, so alpha is a strong convexity constant. It's a bound that depends on the square of the, like one over the square of your strong convexity constant. So, you, you know, you know that the strong convexity constant is very close to zero. So this is not a great bound, but <laughs> is the one we have so far. Uh, and is the best one I think we have uh, we have in any paper. So, um, um, as I said before, part of this kind of project is uh, a research project on how we can uh, implement these methods and write guarantees, etc. The other part of this project is an implementation of what I just described. Uh, so there's an open source project called uh, Jacksop that's on GitHub and also has a, a, some documentation online. And uh, so the, the, the main uh, items, so the main advantages of this project is that first everything is hardware accelerated. So because we implemented everything in, in Jax, this means that if you have a, C, a GPU or a TPU or some accelerator, um, it's going to use it. Nothing to do. There's nothing to program on the user side. It's just going to work. Uh, batchable. So this means that there's some operations that if some operations are uh, nightly parallel, it's going to leverage that also. Like if you need to solve multiple optimization problems at the same time, it's going to be able to do that in parallel. And then, as I said, the main differentiator between this, this library and other libraries 
is that uh, we have a kind of a smart way to differentiate optimization problems. Um, also, one of the things that I think it's important is that we're aiming to be an open source first project. Um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time on the project, uh, reviewing, having discussions, uh, welcoming contributors. We recently have a, had a couple of people contributing on GitHub, which I think it's, uh, it's, very, it's very nice because we want this project to kind of not be just a Google product, but be useful also to other people. So we want to hear feedback from people using it and also welcome contributions of people using it. Uh, one thing, one final thing that I uh, strive for is also to have uh, a lot of examples. I think one of the most useful things in, in a lot of machine learning software is when you have examples that you can quickly adapt uh, so you don't start from scratch when you start a project. So we're still working on it, but so far I think we have some um, some reasonably interesting examples. Uh, so we have notably some examples on dataset distillation, um, on uh, ODE solving. I'm working now on an example on, on meta learning. There's also some some examples on adversarial training. So uh, yeah. A lot of, of thing coming up coming on in, in that uh, in that sense. Okay, so this is the last part. I'm going to end up with some some open questions that we still have um, on the on the techniques of the of implicit differentiation. So one of the challenges that I think we still have is to give an accurate representation uh, or accurate bounds. On, on many of the quantities, like the ones that I presented before, uh, they're good as a first step, but they're not ideal. First, they depend on a lot of quantities that you might not know, like the largest, smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian. Um, for this to be really useful, we, we should control, like have both uh, a better theory, but also kind of empirical rules of thumb on how much you need uh, to get an accurate solution. So far, we've taken a bit of a more conservative approach where uh, we kind of control for tolerances. So you're guaranteed to get an accurate Jacobian. But of course, that comes a bit of the expense of, um, of it being more computationally intensive. Another challenge or another open problem that I would like to see at least some work doing in the future is that of stochastic optimization. Right now, I've said a lot about how to compute gradients or Jacobians of these implicit functions. Uh, but in practice, most of the time, you're computing this grade, these Jacobians, and then you're feeding it into uh, SGD or Adam, some stochastic solver, because there's some other source of randomness. So the question is, OK, if all that you need really is a stochastic gradient, not a full gradient. And by the way, I'm using gradient, but I mean Jacobian. Um, can you develop methods that instead of, you know, driving the full Jacobian drive, just a stochastic estimator, and hopefully these methods would be faster. Right now, I'm not aware of any methods that do that. And so finally, the last part that I wanted to mention is that of scalability. Um, as you might have sus suspected, these methods don't scale great. I'm talking about inverting Hessians and stuff like that. So they're OK if you want to do it at the scale of small data sets like MNIST and CIFAR, but they don't scale to the kind of problem that we would like to solve, which are millions of samples, and millions of dimensions. Uh, so that's kind of a wide open problem. How do you do implicit differentiation in this, uh, in this context? Uh, as an example, uh, I think data set distillation is a good test bed for these kind of problems. We know how to do it on MNIST. It struggles on, on CIFAR, which is kind of a medium-sized problem. Uh, ImageNet, which is where we would really like to do it, is completely out of reach. And uh, so that's it for me. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy, happy to take any. Thank you. That's all good, Lisa. Thank you for a great talk. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, Thanks. Yeah, are there any questions maybe to start? Well, I have a couple. I, okay. Um, well, I mean, what is, you mentioned that it's, it's a large scale. I mean, it's a problem. What is a bottleneck? Is it the linear solver or, or yeah, it's a linear mm -hmm. system solver. What, in what size can you handle? Like what's. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So it's, it's basically the linear solver uh, inverting the Hessian matrix. Um, there's a couple of challenges. So one is, yeah, just doing things like uh, conjugate gradient to invert that linear system, you would need to compute the full, like that would force you to do one full pass over the data set. Yeah. Not to mention like memory requirements. Uh, but the other problem is that sometimes, like on some problems you have some stochasticity uh, given by like properties of, of the problem, like for example, data augmentation. Uh, which means that your gradients are going to be slightly different. Like, okay, uh, yeah, each time you evaluate that linear system is going to be a bit different. Uh, so sometimes, yeah, things like conjugate gradient will not even work. Yeah, I was wondering how you uh, solve the, uh, I mean, you usually don't even store those data sets, so I don't even know. Yeah, exactly. How you exactly. Even yeah, yeah. Solve so, your system. Oh, Okay, right. So, okay, well, one thing I, I should mention is that you never, we never really materialize the matrix, yeah. which is the Hessian matrix, because all that you need in practice is a it's, Hessian vector product, sure, sure. Uh, which you can compute uh, more easily than forming the, the full Hessian, uh, but still requires you to, to do a full pass over the data set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and also Indeed. for the stochastic, I mean, uh, it seems like it's a hard task. I mean, you need... First of all, you need that your solver is is like you know going to the Accurate. optimum, which you yeah. don't generally <laughs> have in stochastic yeah. optimization. So, I mean, what mm -hmm. what are you hoping for there? Um, since even you know you're using mm -hmm. an implicit function, which doesn't seem to even exist, or at least you yeah. don't have it for the expectation. Yeah, yeah. So. One thing is to mention is that despite the fact that in theory we have not great bounds that require strong convexity and whatnot, uh, in practice you can very effectively optimize uh, things where the, the implicit differentiation is done very or far away from the solution. Uh, I suspect this is because optimization is kind of very robust in practice against noises in the gradient. Uh, so we're aiming for the full gradient, but we all know that, you know, to convert to the optimum, you don't need the full gradient. You just need something that correlates positively with the gradient, right. which means that in practice, it's very much okay to compute, uh, yeah, those quantities kind of far away from the solution. And have um, you done hyper parameter tuning stuff with this? I mean, it seems to be ideal for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have a few examples on the on the Jacksoft website. Mm -hmm. um, it it works nicely. However, um, one of the things where or, or one of the reasons why I don't precise, I don't emphasize too much on hyperparameter optimization is because typically you have few hyperparameters. Like I could find problems you have two, three, four hyperparameters. So that usually doesn't really justify the need to do gradient-based optimization on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like as an example problem more data set distillation where you're training your tra like your, your hyperparameters. So what you're learning is your train set and they're kind of every pixel, like you have a problem where the dimension is every single pixel in your learned data set. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that context, you can go to hundreds, thousands of of this, of, of, of hyperparameters. Cool. I, sorry, I was yeah. hogging everyone. Is there any other questions? <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I think I, I have a question. Uh, it's not clear to me uh, yet how, what's the difference about uh, this automatic differentiation and finite, classical finite difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah. at some point you're, you, you I mean, you have to do, you have to, uh, to compute something and, and you're, you're doing 
a numerical approximation mm -hmm. at that moment, right? I mean, no, no, you're not. You never do a numerical approximation. So um, you're not because the software knows what are the derivatives of uh, a set of building block functions. So okay, so maybe... so you have so if I understand well, sorry to interrupt, but if I understand yeah. well, you have a, a library of functions for which you know the derivatives. Is that am I correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. In this example, if if I didn't I, I didn't spend too much time on it, but if you notice all the functions that I'm using, like the sum or the dot product, uh, they're not functions from NumPy. They're functions from uh, from Jax. Yeah. So what this means is that well, it follows the same API, but it does a bit more on top of what standard NumPy functions do, which is what well, they keep track of what is applied where. And then the software knows, for example, what is the derivative of tan h. Like that's kind of hard coded in the library. Okay. So yeah. when 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 you call this gradient here, what it's doing is like kind of repeating the same operations that it did to evaluate, but instead of on here on tan h, it will replace tan h by its derivative. Okay, I see. So, but if, for instance, if you are doing like say a gradient descent on something for which you don't have access to the gradient.f, then the automatic differentiation doesn't work in that context. Am I, am I, am I correct? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? If, 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 you're, if you're in your library, you don't have mm -hmm. access to the gradient of, of that function f because you know, usually you're working with you know, very wild functions, uh, uh, then, then mm -hmm. the automatic differentiation doesn't work yeah. in that context, right? If, yeah, if... exactly. Yeah. Okay, I see. I see. Yes. So part of the, of the motivation here is um, to be able to do something like this, like something that is as transparent as this, but yeah. on functions that are defined as the solution to some optimization problem, okay, uh, which is a class of functions that is um, where automatic differentiation traditional doesn't work well, uh, but still have some structure that you can. I see. You can compute the gradient. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Robin. Thanks. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Um... Thank you again for the great talk. So the I had one curiosity about this alpha mm -hmm. to the minus two that you mentioned in the theorem. Yeah. So like you were saying you find it frustrating for now. I was wondering if you think, so I guess you think that's a, coming from some artifact of the proof or like, mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any, you know, there's reason to think that something fundamental that's really difficult to remove or if it, it, it's really, yeah, here, if it's really yeah. kind of, yeah, very, itself. You yeah. Have numerics to understand. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I think we can remove it basically because it works when alpha is zero. <laughs> and according to this theorem, it should not. Uh, like if we believe that this is tight, then it should not work when alpha is zero or it goes to zero. Uh, like in practice, in most of our problems, we don't have strong convexity. Like we have a lot of eigenvalues that are exactly zero. And uh, computing the, like solving the implicit equations uh, still gives you a reasonable Jacobian. Then there's an open question on what does that mean? Uh, reasonable in the sense that the solution that you find at the end makes sense, gives you like good uh, suboptimality, makes sense from, from a generalization perspective, so on. Um, I don't know if that is because, well, maybe you're actually finding something close to what you want, or maybe the reason why it works is because you get something very far from what you want, but that's still good for learning. For me to be satisfied, like maybe it's just that this quantity, this is not the good quantity to look for. For me to be satisfied, what I would like to have is a theorem that tells you, okay, if you don't have strong convexity, like your alpha is zero, uh, you're still gonna find maybe not a good Jacobian, but one that allows you to learn, for example, telling you that it's still positively correlated with the true gradient. That would be a good result. Are there any other questions? Um, how are we going? Uh, there, there is a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's not a question, it's a comment, because this uh, type of inequality reminds me of what you mm -hmm. have when you use a proof of the method of uh, uh, constant state gradient method for uh, convergence of algorithms. You have the same feature of having this kind of weird mm -hmm. one over alpha square, but which is off, off by the scaling. So right. just perhaps that, I don't know, but uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But that's also a bit why I emphasize on the alpha square because typically for gradient descent, you get something that, because not I don't have squared in the norms. So it, like in optimization, the, what I would have here would be the condition number. So largest eigenvalue divided by smallest one. Uh, that That's also part why like I would be more satisfied if I get something that depends on the condition number, not on the condition number yes. squared. Yes, which of is course. Roughly what I get. <laughs> but after that, you can uh, restrict that and find back after having an estimate like that in the gradient descent, mm -hmm. you get back to an estimate only with the condition number. I see. I see. I see. Well, thanks for the suggestion. Well, I think are there any other questions or? I had another curiosity. Yeah. Did we have time? So you, you were showing the kind of plots of fluid dynamics example. I was wondering if there's any actual mm -hmm. example you implemented trying to differentiate solution to some PD with respect to some parameter. Right. Is that something that is actually happening? Yes. So we're working on that uh, in this project, but there's something that already implements some of that called a JAX NG. I'm going to post the link here, uh, where MD stands for molecular dynamics. Okay. And um, that already has some examples on that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I was just curious. I mean, there's there's a whole, I mean, industry of implicit differentiation or in, in, implicit functions. Uh, mm -hmm for solution functions of optimization problems. I mean, there's, there's whole books on that. Does that come into play at all? I mean, the, these questions when, as to, I mean, hmm. how can I, how can I solve an implicit equation or even generalized implicit equation? Hmm. Um, and, and what kind of regularity do I need and what kind of bounds do I get for, potentially yeah. Lipschitz in, inverses, um, is, mm -hmm. is, is that, yeah. do, is any of that? Right, yeah, so that's a good question. It's true that there, I mean, there's book, a book just about the implicit function theorem. Um, and, uh, and we use as much as we can about that. So what is kind of classical is to get regularities of the solution like of the implicit function of X star. What I haven't seen much is to get regularity conditions of the Jacobian of that function, of that implicit function, uh, which is after all what, what we're actually uh, looking for here. So I think that's kind of the divide between the classical literature and uh, what we would like to have. Okay. Let, let me... Again, there could be some things that I'm uh, missing, but most of the results that I know give you regularity saying, okay, if you have an equation like this, I'm gonna tell you X star is Lipschitz or L smooth or uh, things like that, uh, which is, it's, it's useful uh, and we're kind of using it. That's what allows you to just form the system. Uh, but what I haven't seen much is uh, regularity conditions on this, uh, on this, well, not exactly on this Jacobian, but on this Jacobian when you have some sources of inexactness in solving it. For example, when you have some error in this A matrix, when you have some error in this B matrix, when you have some error in uh, solving the system, but not exactly. This is the kind of guarantees that I'm uh, I'm looking for. And, but but you're absolutely right that like. The initial, the, the starting point of that is to use the classical literature that tells us what are the regularities on this implicit function.
Of no, course. I mean, I, I don't even mean like implicit function theorem in the like calculus two sense, <laughs> but really what you're doing is, I mean, you're, you're, you, you're looking at op optimal solution functions. And for, I mean, those must be relatively simple convex optimization problems. Otherwise your solution wouldn't, first of all, wouldn't be uh, mm. single valued. Second of all, it yeah. wouldn't be differentiable. So, and so mm. I, I'm just wondering, I'm, I mean, that's, the, I'm, I'm just asking, this is, uh, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate because yeah. I'm literally thinking about the same stuff right now with uh, mm. Simona and, and the postdoc. Um, I mean, in the simplest case, like the, let's say you, you, you have literally like a, a proximal operator. I mean, mm. uh, I mean, there are, there, there's already some issues there, right? um in terms of of, of your mm -hmm. regularity and um yeah. I, I i don't think you're going to get away from the strong convexity unless you like have a very specific structure like uh, mm -hmm. like yeah. the interplay of some some linear operator with a sub differential of the regularizer or something like that 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 gives you what 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 the variational analysts would call like strong strong metric regularity mm -hmm. or something like that um yeah uh, but, but I think this is really cool stuff, and where where this where this theory could be applied, like this, I, I, I it's clear that there like these communities don't mm. communicate very well. But for example, Courtney is certainly someone who who knows something from from both from both sides, and I, um, I mean this is I think this could be something where where they mm. could finally apply all these big theorems that yeah. that they have proved and and they have all yeah. these shits bounds and stuff like that i mean your stuff is like you you make it work and it computes so mm -hmm. that i mean you don't need yeah. them necessarily but you could use their mm -hmm. stuff maybe to to get sharper results even yeah 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 thanks a lot for all those suggestions uh yeah i would like to mention a couple of things one is that so you're right that for you need like twice differentiability for this kind of um, irregularity results. But I want to mention that like, if your end goal is not just getting the Jacobian and not plugging that in, um, in, in some solver because you're using this to optimize something else, you're okay if, for example, this is defined almost everywhere, which is the case, for example, for a single, for a, for a prox, sorry, for a projection that might be Lipschitz, but not L smooth. So in a lot of cases, you can get away with, uh, with things not being defined uh, everywhere. And the, the second point that I wanted to make is that you're absolutely right that most of this doesn't even make sense in the non-convex case because you don't even have uniqueness of this X star mapping. Uh, but, but there's a big mismatch between theory and practice because this kind of like the, both the unrolling and implicit differentiation, we kind of use it all the time on non-convex problem and it works just fine. Uh, so I think there's still, yeah, there's still a mismatch there we need to address. Um, Maybe we'll have one last question because there was one in the chat a while yeah. ago. Um, it, I can read it out loud if the person, yeah. unless the person wants to speak, but I guess it's, uh, you mentioned a molecular dynamic solver. Do you need to modify the solver such that all operations are compatible with JAX? Um, so yeah, if you want to do like differentiate of the solution, you need to use something that supports um, automatic differentiation. Could be, could be JAX, could be PyTorch, could be TensorFlow, uh, but yeah, or, the other approach is that you code yourself the you know the implicit equation and and you do it by yourself. Yeah, I mean maybe this is a plug for Jax. If yeah. you guys have never used it, it actually kind of works. So <laughs> <laughs> it's useful. Uh, so, um, but maybe we can end there because it's getting over time. And and yeah. let's thank Fabian one more time for a great talk and and hopefully more. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.